All right, here we are once again. Midweek manna. Get uh, settled back. Get yourself uh, in position. Now, I know some of you, you, you tell me your stories. Some of you are uh, sitting in your car at a lunch break. Some of you in a, in, a, in a lunch room. Some of you are on your back porch. Some of you in your living room. So when I say get your Bible out, some of you are depending upon uh, the same device you're watching this with, which is your phone, and that makes it a challenge for you. Um, some of you uh, are, are not as concerned about that. You're just listening, and that's, that's okay. That's okay. But I trust wherever you are that, that you're able to, you know, just take these 20 or 30 minutes together and, and, and really just isolate. Some of you have told me you've, you have to go back and finish it out some other time because you only got 10 minutes here or 15 minutes there. And again, that's the privilege of the technologies that we have. I just trust that you are enjoying these studies. We are now going into the study of St. John. We, the last two times we've been together, we've, we've done an intro. I've never done that with any of the other studies, but this is such a special, special letter, such a special book. Uh, we've shared already about the difference of it with the other Gospels, and we're going to bring even a little bit more of that out um, in, in today's time together. What I would like to do, uh, it's, it's, it'll be a lengthy read, and then we're going to break it apart uh, the next time we get together. But I want to read beginning at verse 1 and read through verse 18. Um, as we've shared up until now, John has outlived the other disciples. John has um, a mixed audience. Some are still alive and are old as him and have heard about Jesus, the miracles, their whole lifetime. But we definitely have now variations of younger people five years younger, 10 years younger, all until 50 years younger. Um, we understand the ministry of John now has recognized that, that he has to write and communicate in such a way that the next generations um, are understanding the gospel, that since they didn't have the privilege of hearing the words flow out of Jesus' own mouth, or at least uh, immediately hearing it from one of the disciples as they're traveling and saying what Jesus had taught them. Because remember the Great Commission, go into all the world and teach them to observe the things that I've taught you. So again, they were very, very disciplined in, in not embellishing anything. These are the words of Jesus. Now, obviously, now over the span of time, since Jesus being on the earth till now, we have gone very much into commentaries. We've had to do our study to go back to first century practices so that we can get the context whereby they were speaking. Uh, giving one example that I, I have in other times with other studies a lot of people would look at Jesus and, and say, wow, wow, he, he was quite the wordsmith. And I don't want to take away anything out of him. However, most scholars would say Jesus taught and spoke on the most average common man language that you can imagine. I've had others in my study, it would say he really taught on about a sixth grade level. In other words, coming into the age of reason, the age of accountability, and not trying to overwhelm. I mean, you know I'm a school bus driver, and uh, uh, most of my responsibility is middle school age, that, that uh, adolescent age that uh, they're, not, they're not fully alive yet, uh, mentally. And I have to remind myself that all the time. Uh, I, I leave my sarcasm at home because it does not work. Uh, they just miss it. Uh, 
but different examples, different statements. Um, I had a wake-up call this week. I wasn't sure what was going on in the back seat. It looked as though what I had witnessed in the past with somebody vaping, um, and that is taboo, of course, uh, on a bus. I've learned that just because you're vaping doesn't mean you've got bellowing smoke coming out of uh, your ears and nose and, and all around you. They learn how to camouflage all that. And so I stopped the bus, 10-7, went back, and, of course, they were doing something. And I, it was not worth me going back later and, and finding uh, the video of that and looking uh, in, in those lenses. I knew I was stopping whatever was going on. Um, however, I made the statement. I said, is anybody back here vaping? Oh, man, you'd have thought I was just a complete moron. Oh, that is so last year was the comment. <laughs> of course, the adult me wanted to just slap the fire out of that kid. <laughs> Don't talk to me in such a condescending tone. But at the same time, they were speaking of their realm of under— That was last year. We're beyond that. And I said, do I really look that ignorant? No, it, it's it's not gone. Maybe in your world, maybe maybe you've recognized that that's not a healthy thing to do, and I'm I'm thankful for that. Just understand that if it is vaping, I'm going to find out, and and I'm going to have to write you up. So that is just understand. This is a learning moment, and I went on, and that was the end of the conversation. At least they know I'm observant. At least they know I'm I'm probing, and I'm sure they're walking off thinking that dumb old white man. That's fine. That's part of it. Why have I gone to all that diatribe is because, again, we, we understand that Jesus and, and his teaching would say, um, a city set upon a hill uh, can't be hidden. Well, oh, man, what a, what a nice graphic thought. No, there was a city on the hill behind him. Uh, if you have faith as the grain of mustard seed, oh, man, that is great. That's a great metaphor. No, there's the mustard bush right there, and there's one of the seeds. So Jesus was able to communicate authentically is what I'm bringing out. And so now here John comes along, and he realizes, um, number one, that it's not just a Jewish audience any longer. I'm not going to say any more. We're going to bring it out after we read these first 18 verses, but I, I think it will help us without just cutting it up in two and three verses. Let's read beginning of verse 1 of John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet... The world did not know him. He came to his own. His own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at his at the Father's side, and he has made him known. So this passage you probably know. The first few verses I know you know, if you know any scripture at all. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and, and through that Word, that Word was with God. The Word was God. Now, see, that's, that's one of these passages. That's why this study will mean so much to you. It may be the favorite study you've ever done. Because as we shared in the intros, we understand John's audience and, and his responsibility. I have to come against Gnosticism and let them know there's not two Jesuses. There's one. And he's all man and he's all God. He's talking to an audience now that has been infiltrated with Gnosticism, that we're more intelligent than those commoners, those fishermen out of Galilee. No, we, we're intelligent, so we're, we're, we're here to bless the world with our great intelligence. It is John's responsibility to speak to those who are ignorant of any knowledge, and he doesn't want them to be swept into the Gnostic thinking, but to understand the gospel, to understand the words of the Master. So what we have to understand is this, that as this thing began, the whole audience was Jews. Jesus said, I've, I've come into my own. It wasn't until he's leaving the earth and through the power of the Holy Spirit in the life and upon the life and through the life of those disciples that he had mentored that it would go into all the world. He gave them the commission. We understand that from the time of Jesus' life upon the earth and his death, that now 30 years past that, the gospel now has gone deep into the then known world. We understand it's gone into Asia Minor. We understand that it has made its way not only to Greek communities, but it has arrived in Rome the superpower of the then world. 30 years has been a lot of work. We understand that now, uh, six, in AD 60, that the audience is no longer just Jewish. Matter of fact, it has been stated that there would be a hundred thousand Greeks to every one truly Jewish Christian, Messianic. In other words, still plenty of Jews, but but many, you know, Hasidic, Orthodox, um, believe in God, but could not accept Jesus because again, they were looking for a Messiah in a different package. And this Jesus had been crucified on a cross. So, he was just a man. Couldn't have been God. 
That's where it gets very interesting, and I, and I know that you're going to love this study, and especially where we start. Because you got to understand that now John realizes his responsibility to talk to a Greek audience mixed with some Jews. The Jews thought differently than the Greeks. So again, as we shared in one of the intros, communicating anything to children five years of age, it takes a skill set different than the ones that teach a 10th grader. A 40-year-old, a 9-to-9 senior adult in a nursing home. Different methodologies, same message, right? And so here, uh, again, I can relate, and I, I shared this in the last time together, but to embellish a little bit more, in our responsibility going to Scottsdale, Arizona, matter of fact, to the whole state of Arizona, I had the responsibility of, of the youth program for the Church of God uh, throughout the state. Again, very humble means and no budget to work with. Uh, my primary focus was Scottsdale because I'm pastoring there. And um, man, I can remember. Good grief. I, I didn't have any training to do what I was doing. I had teenagers that didn't know anything about the Bible. I shared that last time. But what I didn't share was I could get them together and I could feed them a, a ham sandwich. Uh, they just wanted to hang. They were typical teens. But to start putting the gospel in them, I couldn't talk about Moses because they had no idea who Mo was. I, I couldn't talk about Joseph of Arimathea. They didn't know who Joe was. And so I had to start off with a Bible trivia game and just have some fun with them to start getting some knowledge into them to build the truth upon some working understanding. Great challenge. And so I can relate somewhat to what John was dealing with. And so a common ground, you'll love this, is why John started the way that he did. In the beginning was the Word. Now, for you and I, we've accepted that in Christianity that, you know, uh, yeah, I, I've got my word with me. Uh, I can remember back in the 80s and some of the uh, Carmen videos and songs and all that kind of stuff. It's just some of the fun that you had with young people. You know, the expression uh, word became this emphasis. If you said something that somebody agreed with, word. <laughs> you know, like, dude. Like, yes. And, uh, and yet here is this audience, first century, in the beginning, the beginning of what? The beginning of everything was the Word. Wow, it goes back that far. Well, was it this Bible, printed Bible that was? No. No. The Word was with God. Okay, okay, okay. We well, you know God's Spirit and everlasting. And, okay, so the Word, so, so, what? And the Word was God. What? And through the Word, everything was created. Well, now that's where we start struggling. Now, we just accept it, but, but to have an understanding. Well, to the Jewish audience and to the Greek audience, you're communicating something that we have common ground on. That's, that's, the, that's the brilliance of the opening of this that maybe you've never thought about. And you'll love this because it, it, the Jewish background understood that the spoken word was fearfully alive. So when we talk about idle words, chatter, and, and, and gossip, and uh, little white lies, and on and on, no, every word spoken was alive, fearfully alive. Uh, Eastern thought was it was more than just a sound. It, 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 to give an example from the Word of God, now we understand more of the Genesis account. 
that God spoke. The word spoke. Nothing was created that wasn't created by him. And how did he create? He spoke. Real quickly, I can tell you, I was in Jerusalem a number of years ago, the second time, and I was with Shmuel, Samuel in English. He's a scribe, and, and I'd met him here. He'd actually been in the sanctuary here at Grace Life, and now I had the privilege to be uh, in his backyard, and we were all jet lagged and uh, on that ambassador's trip, and man, we just weren't <laughs> able to hear anything. And I looked around the room, everybody passed out basically, and I, I wasn't learning a thing, but at least I was awake and and just but just struggling. And so I'm apologizing afterward. And he said, oh, I understand, I understand jet lag. He said, you know, it's happened to me going the other way across the pond. And and then I made the statement, I said, Well, I want you to know this, Mule. That from a from a foundation, I believe in the spoken word. And I believe that the original spoken word on this planet was Hebrew. But before it became a language, it was created as a tool. Because the Bible didn't say, and God shaped this with his hands. And No, he spoke, and it became. Shmuel looked at me and basically was saying, you do pretty good for a white boy. And... I said, so I understand a lot has been lost from that. And then he went in, and I, I don't have time to go into all the things he was sharing with me about the power of language. But, but again, it just emphasizes, I'm looking at this again, this, this spoken word being fearfully alive, and it's more than a sound. It's going out. So let me give you another example. <clears throat> As Isaac now, so you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And we understand that uh, why this is going on, that, that Jacob, we forget a lot of times, has a brother, right? He has an elder brother, Esau. And, and now as, as, as Isaac is getting older, he now is getting ready to pass the mantle. Now we know that Jacob, who becomes Israel, Jacob has already deceived his brother or manipulated him, took advantage of a situation. Now, it's Esau's fault, but at the same time, Jacob's definitely um, involved in this. And, and he steals the birthright. But now this, this blessing that is to go to the firstborn, Jacob deceives his own father. You know that story, don't you? But now understand with better understanding what happened in that moment. As Jacob goes in, and he's got, he's got hair on his arms now from an animal, not, not like his brother who just must have looked like a, a woolly something. And as Isaac is now blind and reaching out, and he feels that, oh, this has to be Esau, and he blesses Jacob, what should have been Esau's blessing. And now, about that time, Entering from the side porch, here comes the brother. Hey, wait a minute. You got, but you see, the blessing had already gone out. Isn't that good? In other words, he couldn't, oh, oh, you deceived me. Let's go back. Take two. No. That spoken word had been spoken, and it could not be dissolved, reversed, that blessing went to Jacob. Oh, God, obviously, Esau. So then, of course, Isaac blesses Esau with a different blessing. And we're seeing the results of it today as these brothers are still fighting each other and affecting the whole globe. The point is the spoken word. The word was in the beginning Nothing, and it created everything, and nothing was created without the Word. Now, the next thing we understand is that our Scripture tells us that the Word, as it goes forth, it can't return void. It's going. It's, it's alive. So, now, boy, that ought to speak to all of us about what comes out of our mouth. It is life and death in the tongue. Scripture just keeps repeating this, but let me go on. 
because the difference of the Jews in that audience and the Greeks in that audience is the Jews were very limited in their vocabulary. And the Hebrew language, of course, it's, a, it's an intense language, and it has numerology attached to it. And it's, However, let's just get to the point. The point is they had no more than 10,000 words, period, in their glossary, in their vocabulary. The Greeks had better than 200,000. So again, this, this, this understanding of why starting off the gospel of Jesus Christ to this audience, fighting Gnosticism, it says spirit and matter can't coexist, and yet it is John's responsibility. Oh, yes, Jesus is son of God, son of man. He told us that. He was born of a virgin, but he is God. He rose from the dead. He ascended into the heavenlies and is there until and is seated at the right-hand side of the Father. But I'm not going to leave you without comfort. I'm going to send yet another one. He's part of me. Wow. So you see the importance of this. So, again, by the time he's writing this, the Hebrew language had almost become a dead language, only, only reserved for the scribes, the commoner, so this is where Aramaic language, a, a diversion, a, 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 a substitution, it had Hebrew understanding, but it is, it is bringing Greek and Hebrew language together. And so, again, uh, for the Aramaic people, they, uh, the commoner, we also know this in the Reformation period over 500 years ago, we, with Martin Luther, and, and now it was the Latin language, and the commoner didn't speak Latin, so, so it was only the priest that knew the Word of God, and that's why he said, oh, man, I just read The Just Live by Faith. we got to get it out. So the Gutenberg uh, printing press, all that becomes a lot. Now we understand all this, don't we? So we understand that, that for the Greeks, the word they use, the term, I mean, Put it that way. The term they used for the word word was logos. And so, again, having, you know, a, a lot more uh, exhaustive language and description. Now, and, and we're going to close out here and we'll, we'll pick up. This is where you find the expression, the wisdom literature. So again, the Bibles that we have, Old Testament, New Testament, 400 years separating from Malachi to John crying out in the wilderness. And that's the John, of course, being referenced here that bore witness of, of the word. But there are the intertestamental books known as the apocryphal books. And what are they also known as? The wisdom literature. Wow. Now, we know that the revelation of Jesus Christ also falls into this category of apocryphal language. So again, to the Greeks, the, the term logos not only spoke of a word coming out of our mouth that was very active, but also the power of reason. This is why, again, now Paul would write, and we know this scripture well, Romans 12, that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable worship. Because they understand that wisdom literature, to help the common man, they became the commentaries, how to live practically. So we have to spell it out. We have to develop it. We have to help people understand they, they can't, I can't speak Hebrew. They don't understand that. So this is where the term targums, T-A-R-G-U-M, of wisdom literature, they were basically what we're doing now, of taking something beyond just the upfront. Yeah, but I don't think I understand. Well, let me explain it to you. And now the wisdom literature. So I, I knew you would enjoy today, and now we understand more. 
I'll read just the first five verses again, and look how different it means to you when we understand how fearfully alive, fearfully alive every word is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, see, He, singular, was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. How? And without him was not anything made that was made. In him, the word was life, and that was the that life was the light of men, the light that shines into the darkness, and the darkness can't overcome it. Wow. Doesn't that mean much more to you now? Understanding the wisdom that John had the anointing that he had, the inspiration that he had to bring this great truth. You'll never read John again without now having a greater understanding. And then at the same time, the responsibility. These words are still alive. We'll close with this. When you were knee high to a grasshopper, somebody came to you and said, doesn't matter what they say. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Do we believe that? No. Them words have hurt us. Why? Because they are alive. Let's pray together. We thank you again for this time together. The revelation that you're giving us, the understanding of what you've already done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do through us. We thank you for the word. Thank you. We thank you for the power of it. We know that's why Paul would write later. He said that the word is sharper than a two edged sword, cutting asunder the bone from the marrow. I mean, it, it still does that. It speaks to us, it speaks to our spirit man, it causes us to get the natural man under subjection through the spoken word. We thank you for your word. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust you've enjoyed. I believe that you have. Until next time, God bless.